Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm still Seth Monahan, a man of many words and few ideas. And I'm here today to tell you about what I call backtracking predominance. Now to get things rolling, I want you to listen to these nine bars from Mozart's K332 Piano Sonata, and just ask yourself, how many cadences are there? If you're a regular viewer, you probably had no trouble spotting the imperfect authentic cadence in bar 4. And you probably noticed that the second phrase also ends with 5 going to 1. Not once, not twice, but three times. Now, they can't all be cadences, so which one is, you know, the cadence? Well, the middle one is obviously out. And while we could debate the other two, I'll tell you how I hear it. For me, the first 5 7 to 1 is the actual cadence. This gives us two nicely balanced four bar phrases and then a little bit of extra stuff at the end. And I call these sort of redundant 5 7 to 1 motions echo cadences. They're not real cadences because the phrase is already over, but they imitate cadences. And by doing that, they help to reinforce or, if you will, kind of underline the cadence in bar 8. Which makes sense, because if you know the piece, the music goes in a completely new direction after this. Listen again. Now, I want you to keep all this in mind when we look at this piece, the opening of Mendelssohn's Ruy Blas Overture. The first four chords are a lament bass in a slow tempo. What follows is more animated, but it also stalls out almost immediately. When I play it, Think about how the idea of the echo cadence applies here. So what do we hear? Well, after that solo line soars through a huge diminished seventh arpeggio, we hear the same chord pair three times. That should remind us of the Mozart, and I think it serves a similar purpose, which is to reinforce the end of the phrase. But there's also a problem, and it's a problem of harmonic function. Mozart's phrase ended by toggling fives and ones. You can do that all day. Mendelssohn's doing the same thing, but with five sevens and two sevens. And the result looks like a kind of grammatical error. We've got dominance coming before predominance, and as far as we know, that's not supposed to happen. Well, this is a special situation, and big surprise, it's also the topic of this video. As it turns out, composers sometimes use chords that are normally predominance to reinforce a cadential dominant that's already been set up, it's already in place. For us, so far, 2-4-2 two, two has always been a predominant, but not here. Here, it's acting as what I call a backtracking predominant. And I call it that because when this happens, I hear the music sort of rewinding functionally, rewinding back to the predominant in order to land on the dominant again, and often again, and often again. But when they do this, to my ears at least, they don't actually interrupt the dominant function. So I tend to think of them as embellishing chords, more specifically as neighbor chords, because they almost always come about through stepwise, away, and back motions in the bass. So for me, in this case, the dominant function that Mendelssohn sets up in bar 4 continues until the very end of the passage, making bars 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 a kind of triple underlined half cadence, an enormous arrival on 5. When we listen to the whole thing, see if you can hear it that way, too. Okay. 
Okay, let's review the main points here. Backtracking PDs are chords that normally serve as predominance, but which appear after a cadential dominant. So in that context, they don't have a predominant function. Instead, composers use them to reinforce, decorate, or extend that cadential five. And because their bass almost always moves in and out by step, it's helpful to think of them as contrapuntal neighbor chords, products of that away and back motion, in multiple voices usually. And finally, I think, I think, they might be way more common in minor keys. I'm adding this bullet at the last minute because I literally just noticed that all of the excerpts in this video and all of the ones I have stashed away from my use in the classroom, they're all in minor. Every single one. Who knew? Anyway, the examples I am going to show you today fall into three broad categories with a little bit of overlap. The first involves actual echo cadences like we saw in the Mozart at the start of the video. This is a passage from one of Schubert's violin sonatas, and it comes at the end of a very long phrase. There was no way I could fit the whole thing on screen, so we're just going to dive in with the lead-in to the cadence. And the key signature says C major, but at this point the music has actually moved into C minor. So let's start with the bass line. The first four-note segment starts on scale degree four, rises to five, then to six, which falls back to five. And then the last two note motion repeats. Now, if you watched the last video, this opening lick should look familiar. It's the predominant expansion with the passing tonic 6-4. And of course, that augmented sixth chord is headed for five. That's our half cadence. And what follows is the echo, which draws out that phrase ending dominant. Here's the entire passage. Next up is a song by Beethoven, actually. And once again, we're going to start in the middle of a very long passage, this time in F minor. The first three bars here cycle quickly through versions of 1 and 5-7. But then things slow down as we approach the cadence. The bass line moving into 5 is the old 4 sharp 4 5 lick, taking us into the half cadence. Then follows the echo cadence. But notice here that Beethoven uses a different predominant chord in the echo. Moments ago, he approached five by half step from below. Now, when he repeats the text, he approaches from above. So the echoes don't always need to be literal echoes. Sometimes there's a touch of variety. Here's Fischer Dieskau singing the entire passage. Lass nicht ein Antritz finden, du Gott, dir Langmut und Geduld, dir Langmut und Geduld. Now, you need to know that not every backtracking PD is part of an echo cadence. Sometimes they turn up on the way to the cadence. This is the introduction of the first song of Schubert's Winterreise, and the bass line starts with a long tonic pedal, and then dips down for a little turn figure around the dominant before resolving back to one. Harmonically, the first four bars are just tonic and dominant over that pedal.
And of course the phrase ends with a PAC. Now, the middle of the phrase is where Schubert harmonizes the bass line four, five, six. And if we look at the actual chords, we find four, four, six, and one, six, four in the middle. So we might well assume that this was the idiom we studied in the last video, and which we also saw in the Schubert, two examples back, which is to say, two predominants connected by a passing chord. But that interpretation ignores rhythm. We don't talk about rhythm much in these lessons, but sometimes you need to think about rhythm to hear the harmony the right way. And here's what I mean. If you watched video 37, you know that passing 164 always falls on a weak beat or a weak bar. But this 164 falls on a strong beat in a strong bar. So it's not passing. Now, given what we know, a strong beat tonic 6-4 near the end of a phrase is way more likely to be a cadential 6-4. But this is something new for us, because what is a cadential 6-4 doing resolving to 4-6? Well, it's not really resolving at all, and that 4-6 sure as heck is no regular predominant. It's actually a backtracking PD a contrapuntal neighbor chord that embellishes the cadential 6-4 and draws out the dominant function into the next bar, where, I should point out, the cadential 6-4 returns and then actually resolves. Now, before we listen to the whole thing, remember the key point here. In this piece, and the next few as well, the backtracking PD arrives after the cadential dominant, which it always does, but before the actual cadence. So now we're going to move back into F minor for a Haydn string quartet passage that does something similar. But this time, there are two different backtracking predominants before the actual cadence. It's an 8-bar theme, but weirdly proportioned because the dominant arrives in bar 5, right here. And listen to what the bass line does. It circles around scale degree 5, going to chromatic neighbors on either side. The first motion, down by half step, is to 7, 7 of 5, and back. And then the second one is up to a German augmented 6th, and back. But look closer. That last 5 chord is actually a dominant bass under a big pile of non-chord tones that all resolve by semitone three times. So here's the entire dominant expansion. And here it is in context played by real musicians. Review time. So far, we've seen that backtracking PDs in this pre-cadential category can actually come between a cadential 6-4 and its resolution. We've also seen that they can lie a step above or a step below the dominant, and when we get both, they don't need to be the same chord, obviously. The last thing I'll show you is that we can go directly from an upper neighbor to a lower neighbor, or vice versa, skipping five in the process. We see this in the cadence of the main theme from Beethoven's Pathétique Sonata. The bass motion into the elided PAC has all the same notes as our last example. But the red arrow here shows that the semitone above the bass jumps directly down to the semitone below the bass. That means that the last G in the bass does the work of resolving A-flat and F-sharp at once. 
As far as the actual chords go, it's a standard walk up the scale to a cadential 6-4, and then we get to the backtracking PDs. It's cadential 6-4, German augmented 6th, 7-7-5, seven, seven, and finally the 5 chord itself, which goes to 1. Here's the whole thing starting at the beginning of the phrase. It goes by fast. So my last two examples are from what I think is sort of a third category here, but it definitely blends elements of the other two. I want you to listen to the beginning of that Beethoven song we sampled earlier. In this case, I think the old how many cadences question gets surprisingly tricky. Now, there's probably a bunch of ways you could hear this, but for me, it sounds at first, at first, like there's a half cadence in bar three. But what follows is not a whole phrase in itself, but neither is it an echo cadence. It's just a backtracking PD and then another cadential 6-4 resolving. To my ears, it's as if Beethoven sort of offers us a half cadence in bar three, but then has a change of heart and keeps the phrase going for another two bars. With the result being that the first cadential 6-4 sort of opens up the cadential space, but then it's the second one that actually closes it two bars later. So I call this the cadential extension type of backtracking PD. It doesn't come before the cadence or after the cadence, it comes as sort of part of the cadence process itself. Here's another one from Mozart's Magic Flute. We actually saw this one in video 31, but I only played it to hear because the point was to show you the quiescenza that starts the phrase. And if you listen to it on its own, what follows that feels like a perfectly self-sufficient half cadence. But then there's more stuff. More predominance going to dominance. Now, those are definitely more like echo cadences than what we heard in the Beethoven just now. But for me, this one still lies in a gray area. Maybe because the text of each of the two backtracking predominance is different. In other words, the echoes here don't echo each other, but honestly, that's kind of subjective. Listen for yourself and see what you think. And there it is, two short videos in a row. Next time we meet, it'll be a more mainstream topic with my introduction to harmonic sequences. I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.